Since this channel's inception, we have examined several encounters with strange entities, which took place in remote North American communities. In many of these cases, the bizarre nature of the incident has gone on to immortalize not only the being itself, but also the location in which it was seen. In this episode, we will be exploring one of America's most infamous encounters. Join us as we recount the tale of the Flatwoods Monster. When researching the specific culture and history of each of the 50 states of America, one will unearth many tales of alleged cryptid and alien encounters. These stories, having been continually retold and passed down through the years, ultimately grant both the location of the event itself and its unexpected visitor something of a celebrity status. Such incidents have included the Lizard Man of South Carolina's Scape or Swamp, Iowa's bizarre van meter visitor, and the haunting Dover Demon. With these tales being so numerous, commentators will often jest that every US state possesses its own infamous and exotic monstrous inhabitant. In one of our earliest episodes, we recounted in some detail the story of West Virginia's most bizarre visitor, the mysterious Mothman of Point Pleasant. But the Mothman is not the state's only celebrated cryptid, with another strange being having generated an equal degree of notoriety some 15 years prior, located only 25 miles to the east of the small city where the Mothman sightings occurred. An equally mystifying creature, whose intentions still remain unexplained to this day, and forever changed the lives of the small group of people who encountered it. The events in question played out during the early evening of September the 12th, 1952, on the outskirts of Flatwoods, a small town situated within West Virginia's central Braxton County. Dusk had just begun to fall when two brothers, Edward and Fred May, were still outside playing near their home along with another of their young friends. Just as the game they were playing was coming to an end, they suddenly caught sight of something unexpected slowly appearing in the skies above them. They watched on with increasing curiosity at what appeared to be a brilliant red fireball, materializing from within the dark clouds hanging low above their heads. Initially believing this to be a falling meteor, their excitement quickly turned to confusion when they observed the manner in which the fiery object was traveling. It seemed to be decelerating in speed as it traveled towards the ground, almost as if it was carrying out some form of controlled descent. In no time at all, the glowing object disappeared from sight, apparently having landed amidst the trees of some nearby woodland. Bewildered by what they had witnessed, Edward and his brother quickly hurried home with their friend to tell their mother. Initially skeptical of the story, Kathleen May's resolve shifted when she saw the unwavering concern and alarm in her two children. Their insistence spurred her to take action and investigate the matter herself. At their behest, she warily agreed to escort them into the woods to the location where they believed the object had landed stating that they would take the family's pet dog with them as a precaution. She further decided to call a family friend, Eugene Lemon, to go with them, believing that his experience as a National Guardsman would provide further safety. Lemon duly attended the May household a short time later, 
accompanied by two of his own friends, before the entire group then slowly set off on foot into the woods. Cautiously, the small group made their way deeper into the tree line, realizing that they were traveling in the direction of a local farm, which belonged to one of their neighbors. Several minutes later, upon cresting a small rise which looked down onto an open patch of land within the forest boundaries, they located what the boys had witnessed. All would describe it as an egg-shaped craft of some kind, which was continually radiating a dull crimson glow, generated from somewhere deep inside its interior. In addition to this pulsing red light, the strange object was emitting a large amount of greenish vapor, which seemingly clung low to the ground where it had landed. Acting on instinct, the family dog aggressively slipped its lead and then ran down towards the object, where it then suffered a violently adverse reaction to the vapor. Immediately becoming distressed and agitated, it turned and ran directly past its astonished masters, heading back in the direction of their home. But before anyone could turn to follow the animal, the group had been disturbed by a loud and persistent hissing sound emanating from somewhere above them. As they had tried to identify this unsettling commotion, the beam from Eugene's torch suddenly picked out an unnatural shape concealed within the reaches of a nearby tree. The dim light caught only fleeting glimpses of a strange figure, but even those few features were sufficient to ignite an immediate and overwhelming sense of terror in those standing below. Somehow suspended in mid-air was a humanoid figure approximately 10 feet tall, emitting a green mist from its body, similar to the eerie substance emanating from the nearby object. It was attired in what looked like a dark green cloak which rose up to form a hood, the shape of which resembled the ace of spades, framing a bright red head and face. The beam from Lemon's torch had just picked out what resembled a pair of claw-like talons at the extremities of the creature's arms, when something even more bizarre took place. Two columns of red light shot vertically from the entity's head, almost as if it had opened its eyes and was scanning the skies above. These beams then gradually moved down towards the onlookers below and rested upon them for a moment, before the entity generated a further sinister hissing sound. Moments later, the bizarre apparition began to slowly descend from its hiding place, its body gliding along a steady and controlled path as it did so. The two beams of light being projected from its eyes remained firmly fixed upon the small group as a growing cloud of mist accompanied its descent. At this point, with a cry of unrestrained fear, Lemon dropped his torch and turned on his heel, running as fast as he could from the woods, hurriedly followed by everyone else. In the aftermath, the May household called the state police for assistance. Meanwhile, the health of several individuals who had been present in the woods rapidly deteriorated. Not only were several of those who had encountered the entity affected by dizziness and vomiting, but the family dog was also in a bad way. The police officers listened impassively as the witnesses related their tale, exchanging quizzical looks before they later headed off into the woods themselves. They would return after half an hour, stating that there was no trace of either the object, the mysterious entity that had accompanied it, or the green mist the witnesses had described. Statements were taken, and then the officers left, with word quickly spreading through town about the alleged incident, leading to further searches by neighbors over the coming days. But beyond some undefined indentations found in the ground at various points throughout the area, and some freshly broken foliage, no physical evidence of the encounter was found. However, the fantastic nature of the story continued to propel it far beyond the boundaries of Flatwoods. With national media outlets hungry to hear more about the incident, 
Numerous publications ultimately descended upon the town, leading to Kathleen May and Eugene Lemon being asked to participate in a CBS television interview to recount their tale. At this point, more witnesses came forward, adding further credence to a story which had seemed completely unbelievable prior to these additional accounts. Several weeks before, a young girl named Audra Harper and her friend had been taking a shortcut home through Woodland near the town of Heaters, located not far from Flatwoods. Suddenly, the skies above them were bathed in an eerie red glow, which appeared to be emanating from a large orb that had landed atop a nearby hillside. Disturbed by a movement behind them, the two girls turned to see an impossibly tall and thin shadowy figure emerging from within the adjoining tree line. They immediately ran off as quickly as they could, later sharing the encounter with their parents, who had instead admonished them for walking alone in the woods after dark. Then, a married couple named Edith and George Snatowski came forwards to describe an incident which they claimed had taken place the day after the May family sighting. That evening, the husband and wife had been travelling in their car with their 18-month-old son along Route 4, around 20 miles south of Flatwoods. Without any warning, the engine of their car had cut out, causing it to coast to a complete stop where it had then stubbornly refused to restart. George had then popped the bonnet and stepped out of the vehicle to investigate further, when he suddenly stopped as both he and the car were illuminated by a bright light coming from above. Overcome by an intense smell of sulphur, a dark figure materialised on the road ahead of him and began to make its way towards the car. Taking refuge back inside the vehicle, George and Edith watched as this reptilian-like figure approached, resting its hands on the bonnet and peering in at them through the windows in an inquisitive manner. Seemingly satisfied with what it had observed, this unearthly visitor then turned and walked back the way it came, vanishing with the light being cast down onto the scene. Not long after, the engine of the Snetowski's car had inexplicably fired back into life, allowing them to continue with their journey. As with many similar incidents from the North American mainland, the Flatwoods monster has gone on to cement itself firmly in supernatural lore. It has been depicted in movies and television shows, as well as being recreated as an antagonist in the highly successful video game franchise, Fallout. And yet, with no apparent physical evidence that the incident ever took place, is there anything more to this tale than the questionable testimony of a small group of people? Skeptics point to alterations in the descriptions of the creature provided by the May family and their associates, as the story inevitably went on to gain traction across the country, and later, internationally. For instance, the figure was originally described as having been of average human height, but appears to have grown to twice that size over the lifetime of successive retellings. Elsewhere, the complexion of the entity was somewhat unclear. Both Edward and Fred were convinced it was robotic in nature, most likely some form of automated guardian or sentinel which had been watching over the nearby craft before becoming aware of the approaching witnesses. But in the same breath, they describe very animalistic and organic talons at the extremities of the creature's arms. This element in particular offers an alternative explanation for the encounter, with the claws sounding very much like those of a barn owl perched up in the tree, its shape and shadow possibly being grossly distorted by the torchlight that was cast upon it. This was a theory put forth by Joe Nickel, who, it should be noted, has something of a reputation for dismissing alien encounters as the misidentification of owls attempting to debunk both the Kelly Hopkinsville case and the Mothman sightings in the same way. That being said, the encounter took place at a highly tense period during America's history. 
The national media generated a great degree of fear relating to Soviet spies and military incursions. So it's not entirely beyond the realm of possibility that the family witnessed something they could not explain and allowed their imaginations to fill in the gaps. And yet, there is evidence that the US government may have acted to try and cover up this event along with several others that occurred around the same time for reasons which remain unknown to this day. Many years later, a local National Guard officer named Captain Dale Levitt disclosed that he and his men had been deployed to the forests around Flatwoods soon after the event. Apparently, they had seized metal fragments and oily residue which they had discovered nearby. The men had then packed these up and sent them off to Washington, D.C. for analysis. At the same time, there was a much wider string of UFO sightings taking place along America's eastern seaboard, which resulted in the loss of a military interceptor aircraft. An F-94 Starfire had taken off from its base in Tampa, Florida, around the exact time that the Flatwoods incident was alleged to have occurred. Its pilot was ordered to follow a patrol route as part of an increased offensive strategy, generated by the wave of UFO sightings that were being reported at the time. But not long after it had arrived within its patrol area, the Starfire unexpectedly disappeared from radar screens, prompting a far-reaching yet unsuccessful search and rescue mission. In the years that followed, all record of the aircraft and its crew, John Jones Jr. and John Del Curto, were quietly removed from United States Air Force records. The military refused to answer any subsequent inquiries over the incident, including those submitted by the families of the two missing airmen. Speculation has been prompted that whatever came down from the skies above Flatwoods may have been involved in an encounter of its own with the missing military interceptor. When all is said and done, the Flatwoods incident is similar to many other such encounters of its ilk, in that no other related sightings were again reported after it took place. The creatures involved in such cases are presented in a very different manner to other mysterious entities, such as the Skinwalker or Sasquatch, seeming to have only visited for a very brief and solitary time, rather than settling into any extensive residence. And yet, despite its remote nature, its wider legacy sees thousands of visitors to the small and otherwise unassuming West Virginian town every year all desperate to find evidence in favour of the story and to spend their hard-earned cash on souvenirs from its retelling. But in the end, only those who were there that day will ever know the truth.